All right, everyone. Sorry for the slight delay. Still trying to work through a couple tech issues here. Um, so today we're going to finish up with our review of biomolecules. Speak briefly about enzymes and then dive straight into cellular metabolism. So when we left off, we had talked about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So we see lots of OH groups, hydroxyl groups, alcohol groups hanging off, uh, giving them polar properties, uh, which we're going to remember when we get to our membranes. And we saw that our lipids were mainly made up of uh, just hydrocarbons, so lots and lots of carbon and hydrogen, not much of anything else, which makes them non-polar hydrophobic, makes them repel water. We looked at one very special group, the phospholipids. They're going to be the building blocks of cell membranes later on. We know that they're antipathic, have one polar end that likes water, hydrophilic part, and then the typical hydrocarbon fatty acid tails that are hydrophobic and repel water. So we've just moved into our third group, the proteins, which we now know are built up of a variety of amino acids. So we have basically 20 choices for amino acids. We don't need to know all 20. We don't really need to know any in specific for this course right now. Uh, but we do want to know the basic structure uh, and where we'll see variation so we can understand why we have different proteins that do different things. So we were looking at these sample little amino acids building into a protein. And we are looking at the first step of building a protein, which is forming a peptide bond. So we saw that our structure of an amino acid has a central carbon, and we have a hydrogen hanging off the bottom. And on either side, in every amino acid, we're going to have an amino group formed around nitrogen. And we're going to have a carboxyl group on the opposite side. So every amino acid has these three parts. And the part that makes our amino acids vary, so the reason we have 20 different ones, are these R groups. So these R groups, R just stands for like a like an F, like a blank. There's something there. This is the variable part of the amino acid. Um, so that's what is marked here. So our peptide bond forms between the two parts that we see on every amino acid, the carboxyl group and the amino group. So when we form a polypeptide, so a series of peptide bonds between many amino acids, we're gonna see that the chain is always gonna look like nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon. So if we have all the atoms written out for the format of our protein, uh, we're going to see that structure where we have these nitrogens alternating with our two carbons. So we're going to see lots and lots of nitrogen if we're looking at a protein. So a peptide, a polypeptide, many peptides, uh, we're going to call them that if we have about two to 50 amino acids. But when we say protein, we're talking about the same sort of structure, the same sort of building blocks, but we're talking about something much bigger. So we're going to start to refer to proteins when we have more than 50 amino acids. We may actually have multiple chains of amino acids, so multiple polypeptides uh, that kind of fit together like Legos that join together uh, to form one sort of functional unit. So when we talk about proteins, we talk about levels of structure because this gets kind of complex. Um, and actually, I remember back in the day, so we probably do still like this, protein folding is its whole own field and they have big sort of crowdsourced uh, projects trying to figure out how specific proteins will fold into some 
specific shapes. So the first level of a protein is its primary structure. So the primary structure is just that um, structure of those peptide bonds, so that chain of amino acids. That's the first level of primary structure of building a protein. So we have amino acid one, two, three, and so on. And we have these peptide bonds, which are covalent bonds. So we have uh, shared electrons here between those carbons and nitrogen all down the line. In our secondary structure is where our proteins start to get more complicated, start to fold. So in our secondary structure, we're going to start to see um, folding into two specific shapes. So parts of those chains are going to form either these sort of twists, these ringlets, these helices. So this first shape here, this one, is an alpha helix. So alpha like A, we just name these shapes A and B. So the alpha helix is one type of secondary structure we'll see in a protein. The other type of structure we may see as our protein begins to fold is beta, right, A and B. So a beta pleated sheet. So a sheet is kind of flat, but it has some kinks in it. So then, so like a pleated skirt, this beta pleated sheet is a shape that we will see within our proteins. So this is uh, formed by basically hydrogen bonding. So this uh, sort of magnetism, right? This attraction between these hydrogens on those amino groups and those oxygens on the carboxyl group. So this is not a covalent bond. Um, this is uh, that attraction between the hydrogen and the oxygen. The dotted line means they're not like bonded to each other, not covalently bonded. So those are hydrogen bonds. Our tertiary structure is another level of complication, right? So we're still building this protein, so we're continuing to fold it. So we can see some of those secondary structures that we just talked about within this. So here we see that part of our chain has formed an alpha helix, another part formed a beta pleated sheet. So that's what we see here. But then we have other strings that didn't make any of those characteristic shapes. Um, and we started to sort of ball this protein up, that's our tertiary structure of the protein. So the primary structure is the covalent peptide bonds forming polypeptides, so just a straight chain. Our secondary structure are the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets, which we can see in combination in any specific protein. So that's held together by those hydrogen bonds. And then our tertiary structure, we're starting to see this um, ball up into three dimensions as we start to have more complicated interactions um, between uh, basically those R variable R groups. Finally, our quaternary structure. Quaternary structure, what you're looking at here is actually hemoglobin, so a protein in blood, so in red blood cells. This is what carries oxygen. So we actually have would have started when we build hemoglobin with four different polypeptides. So we have four chains with their peptide bonds. Each of them individually would have started to form a secondary structure. So those alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And then each of them individually, as their R groups start to interact in complex ways with each other, would have started to crumple up. We would have ended up with basically four crumpled up sheets of paper from those four chains. And now they come together and associate with each other to form this larger protein. So that's why there's slightly different coloration here. Uh, so the quaternary, so quaternary fourth structure that we see in the protein is when we have uh, these subunits. So subunits, uh, little parts, right? start to come together uh, and they get attracted to each other depending on what uh, physical and chemical properties those R groups facing the outside have.
questions about this sort of general idea of protein structure. We don't have to understand all the nitty gritty of amino acids and all the very specific chemistry here, but we want to understand basically how proteins get their shape because their shape is going to be super important as we start to talk about why enzymes are the way they do it, for example. So before we move into our specific example of proteins, which will be the enzymes that come after this, we're going to quick touch on our nucleic acids, just to be complete with our biomolecule. Um, we won't see that many nucleic acids in this course. Uh, if you take genetics later, I'm sure you'll see these a lot in the future. So we have a basic structure for our nucleotides. So our nucleotides are going to be built around a five carbon sugar, so around a carbohydrate. So we're going to see a ring with hydroxyl groups here in the center. They're going to have a phosphate group over here on one side. And then they're going to have a nitrogenous base hanging on the other side. So that's our basic structure. But we have two types of nucleic acids that we commonly pay attention to. So we have DNA and RNA. So DNA is going to be your genome in the nucleus of the cell. That's where all your genes are. And the genes essentially code for proteins that actually do stuff in your body. But RNA is also super important. RNA, what sends that signal out from the DNA to go build those proteins. Okay, so the difference between those two uh, on the chemistry level is partially that sugar in the center, that carbohydrate, we can have either deoxyribose or ribose as that sugar. So we have two options. So deoxyribose is why the DNA starts with a D. So it's deoxyribonucleic acid. That's where we get that abbreviation from. Versus RNA is ribo for that ribose sugar, nucleic acid. If we want to key in on the difference there, why these two things have different names, deoxy, D, like removing something, means it has one less oxygen. So you can see here how the ribose has these two hydroxyl groups hanging off the bottom versus the DNA sugar, the deoxyribose, has one right there. But where the ribose would have a second one, we just have a hydrogen. So it has one less oxygen, so it's deoxy. So the other thing that we're going to see vary between nucleic acids are our bases. So we have multiple different options for these nitrogenous bases that we have coming up here. So these are divided into pyrimidines and purines uh, based on whether they have just like one nitrogenous ring or two. And we have options, so cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pyrimidines. So they just have that one nitrogenous ring. First are purines, adenine, and guanine. And when we write out DNA sequences, you know, A, T, C, G, whatever, that's what we're talking about, these different orders of the nucleic acids. Uh, and if we're talking about the difference between uh, DNA and RNA, uh, we'll see that uracil is only going to be in the RNA. Thymine is in its place in the DNA. Uh, so the purines stay the same in both. What we will see uh, are some specific little nucleotides uh, as we talk about metabolism. So we can kind of lump them together uh, with those nucleic acids. 
Uh, so specifically, we're going to see energy transferring nucleotides. So what we're building towards, right, is understanding metabolism, understanding how do our cells make energy so that they can do so. So we want to know how they get ATP, which is going to drive a lot of cellular processes. Um, so ATP are basically format for, for cellular energy is a nucleotide, an energy transferring nucleotide. So that's what we see on the bottom here. So we can see that same sort of structure that we just looked at, right? It's actually adenosine, so that's like the A from our DNA code. Um, so we can see that it has a sugar, right? So here is our sugar in the center. We can see it has a nitrogenous base over here, but the difference between this and our monomers for DNA and RNA over here in the phosphates, so instead of just having one phosphate group that could form like the background of a strand of DNA, we see we have one, two, three phosphate groups. So that's why there's a T in a TP, T for tri, triphosphate, three phosphate groups. So when we start to talk about forming ATP so that we have usable energy in our cells, we're actually using ATP in our cells. What we're talking about is looking at this last bond between our phosphate groups. If we want to put energy into ATP and hold it in an ATP molecule, we form that bond, so tack on a third phosphate group. And when it's time to release energy, we're going to go ahead and break that bond. And we'll start to see a separate phosphate group. And then now that we only have two phosphates left on this molecule, it'll drop down. So we're going to change its name to adenosine diphosphate. We only have two phosphates left. So that's our ADP. So as we start to look at our maps in metabolism, these sort of flowcharts, these chemical equations, we're going to see ADP in this low energy form, missing a phosphate group, and ATP holding energy in that bond uh, once we get energy to form that bond. Other nucleotides that we'll see as we move into metabolism are NAD and FAD. So I didn't pull those out exactly what they look like, um, but they work in similar-ish ways. So these are also going to be able to transfer energy, so basically temporarily storing things that we can use as energy within these nucleotides, NAD and FAD. So as we move into metabolism, we're gonna be calling them electron carriers. And because they're carrying electrons, we're going to be able to move those electrons around basically kind of as a form of energy within our process of cellular respiration. So when we see those as we get into cellular respiration, you can know that they are uh, a form of a nucleotide. The final thing that we will see referenced in the future is a cell signaling kind of nucleotide uh, really called uh, we'll see cyclic AMP cyclic AMP as a molecule within a cell uh, that tells the cell to do certain processes within <clears throat> the cell so when we eventually get to those and they're thinking oh, what is that molecule how is it related to our different classes of biomolecules it is a form of a nucleotide. Uh, so it has that sugar in the center. It has a nitrogenous base, but instead of its phosphate group just kind of hanging off, it actually formed a circle. So that's where the C comes from, the cyclic AMP. Cyclic GMP also exists. We won't really talk about it in this course. That's why I'm focusing on that cyclic AMP. Our next topic is enzymes. So enzymes are proteins, um, but they have really important roles in chemical reactions. So we want to dive into those 
uh, separately and on their own. But they aren't a separate class of molecules from these uh, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, these four that we just went through. Uh, they are a type of protein. So they're a type of protein that acts as a catalyst in a biological system. So it's going to take a chemical reaction and act as a catalyst in that reaction, basically to speed it up. That's what a catalyst is, something that is able to change our reaction rate. So we're going to speed up our reaction rate. We're going to increase the reaction rate. The way enzymes do that is that they're going to decrease the activation energy for a chemical reaction. So for every chemical reaction we have, as we start with some products, or, or sorry, as we start with some substrates or some reactants, so over here on the left, those substrates need to gather a certain amount of energy, the activation energy, before this reaction proceeds to the right, forming the product. So in order to go in a specific direction, there is an activation energy that we need to overcome. Enzymes help us lower that activation energy so we don't need to collect up as much energy in order for this reaction to happen. And this is super helpful when we're talking about your body, when we're talking inside a cell, because we want to control how fast chemical reactions happen. And we don't have to want to have to just like wait around for them to happen, right? We want these to happen basically on demand. So enzymes are going to let us do that. So the way this happens is that enzymes are going to bind on to a reactant or a substrate, right? So we can see that we added in an en uh, we added in an enzyme to this equation, right? In chemistry, you would have just said you would have probably just seen the reactants. So we have these enzymes with our substrates, creating this enzyme substrate complex. So they're kind of bound together. They're hooked up next to each other. And then we move forward. And once we create this product, we can break off that enzyme. And we can go ahead and reuse that enzyme to do this reaction again. So those enzymes are going to be reusable. Okay. So when we're talking about that activation energy barrier, so what we're talking about, right, is that we're going to start with reactants that have a certain amount of energy. Okay. So we're going to start with reactants with a certain amount of energy. And they are going to need to collect some energy before this reaction can proceed. So without an enzyme, we can see that in this reaction, we need to collect an awful lot of energy in order to create our products. The products are gonna have a lower amount of energy here than our reactants. Now this takes some time, right? So this is gonna take time to get that energy. So, what our enzymes are gonna do for us is just lower it so that we can speed it up, right? So now we need only like half as much with the enzyme versus without the enzyme. Uh, so that's gonna make it easier for our, to, us to get these products out of the reaction, out of the reactants. So when we see a graph like this, what we're looking at is the amount of energy on the y-axis versus the reaction coordinate so basically the direction that the reaction is proceeding. So like you saw that equation with the enzyme and the substrate forming the complex and then forming the product and letting go of the enzyme. That's what we're talking about here. Basically, it's just proceeding along that equation. So there are some theories about how this works. There have been some developments in how we think about enzymes and how they are able to have this catalytic property, how they are able 
to decrease the activation energy. Uh, so the first one is probably what you've seen before, uh, either in your prerequisites or maybe even in high school, is this kind of lock and key model. So this is still helpful to think about when we're first trying to understand enzymes, even though it isn't really scientifically quite what's happening. So in the lock and key model, we think about <laughs> an enzyme that has a specific shape, right? A specific shape like that. So this is our lock. The enzyme is the lock. And then we think about our substrate as being the key that fits into that lock, right? So this is still kind of how an enzyme works. It's helpful to understand that they're locking together in this way because that's part of how our enzymes are going to be holding our reactant in the right position because basically holding it in the right position is why we don't need as much energy, right? When we're thinking about activation energy, we're kind of thinking about molecules wandering around waiting until they bump into each other, right? If you hold your reactant in the right position in the right place, you don't need to wait as long for it to randomly bump into something else. So that can partially kind of explain what's happening. But when we think about the chemical reaction, right, we know that our reactant and our product aren't the same thing, right? We did this chemical reaction to get something different. So the reactant and the product are not really going to have the same shape, right? So if our reactant is a square, maybe the thing we're trying to make, right, is a triangle. But enzyme reactions are often reversible, so we can do them in one direction, but we can also go from that product and make the reactant, right? We can either uh, go from A to B, but we'll often see that these arrows go both ways, right? So our reaction is reversible. So if it was really just a lock and key, that triangle wouldn't fit into that square lock. Uh, so this is inadequate to fully understand how enzymes work. So we have a slight kind of modification to this idea for enzymes, which is something called the induced fit model. So to induce something, right, that's a, a word out in the world. So induce means to make something happen. Uh, so an induced fit model means we're making these things fit together, right? They're not always exactly the same shape that perfectly fit together, we can actually have an effect on their shape a little bit. We can make them fit. So that's the induced fit model. We're going to click forward. So we're starting with an enzyme that has a sort of square uh, pocket, this uh, site for our reactant to bind in. But we can see in this reaction, we're actually looking at a round substrate. And what we see happening here is that that substrate is binding in to this activation site in the enzyme anyway, right? So it's binding in anyway, even though they weren't the same shape. And the enzyme is kind of molding like Play-Doh to fit that substrate. So it can do that partially because of what we we're talking about, those four levels of protein shape. Right, we talked about the protein folding and how it depends on the interactions of the R group, which have different chemical properties depending on which R group they are. Um, so when we have a reaction between two things in chemistry, and I'm not a chemist, right? So bear that in mind. So this is going to be my polypeptide chain. When I say we're having reactions between R groups, Let's say we have one R group over here, another R group over here, an another R group over there, whatever, something like that, right? So R groups that are near each other are going to interact, right? Maybe they're going to repel each other. Maybe they're going to be attracted to each other. All depends on what exactly they are. Um, so the reason we can change this enzymatic shape 
is because whatever's on the outside of the substrate, so whatever molecule this is, it's coming in. I'm going to write an S. All right. And now it's near this R group. They're both chemicals of some kind. They're going to interact in some way. So that can kind of disturb whatever's going on between these two R groups, right? So we could either have these things attracted to each other. Maybe it's repelling this one. It can kind of change the shape a little bit. We don't need to understand any of the specifics about that. We're just thinking about these broad, general kind of brush strokes uh, when we think about chemistry within this class. So that's the induced fit, is that those interactions between the substrate and the enzyme you kind of change the shape of the enzyme a little bit so that they fit together better. And then as we have that reaction happen, we get our product. The product is a new shape. And when it's released, the enzyme may go back to its original shape. Right? And then we might be able to do this in the reverse because whatever is binding in here to that site is going to have an effect on the shape of the enzyme itself. So that's just the difference between the induced fit model and the lock and key model. Lock and key, they have to be the same shape from the beginning. Induced fit, there's a little wiggle room, basically. When we think about enzymes, we also want to know that these two other things exist called cofactors and coenzymes. And they basically help enzymes work. Um, so they're going to do that basically because they're going to have subtle effects on the shape of the enzyme, on the chemistry of the enzyme. Um, but what you want to know is that they are not made of protein. They're an extra little group of something that is binding into this enzyme in some way. So our cofactors, cofactors, so the co is telling you it's working with the enzyme, the cofactor, that factor part uh, is usually going to be like a trace metal um, sort of binding in to help the enzyme hold its shape. So to help it hold a shape that's going to fit well with the substrate. A coenzyme also working with the enzyme. The coenzyme is usually going to be something like a vitamin. Okay. And the coenzymes work a little bit different than the cofactors. Uh, the coenzymes are going to actually transfer small chemical groups. Right? So they're actually going to add little bits of atoms to our enzymes as they help this reaction occur. So they're not catalysts themselves. They're working again in conjunction with the enzyme. Okay. And next we're going to talk about reaction rates. So we know that the enzymes are helping us lower activation energy. So they're helping a reaction proceed. They're helping us get the product out. Um, this means uh, that reactions are happening at a specific speed. And so we can also think of enzymes it's kind of working at a specific rate speed. So an enzyme's catalytic rate, its catalytic rate is how many molecules, like how many units of product it's making per unit of time. So you're going to have like five molecules per nanosecond or whatever. I don't know how fast reactions are in chemistry. So that's the kind of units we'll, we'll see on our catalytic rate. So this is going to be dependent on the substrate concentration. So it's going to be dependent on how much stuff we have to start with, right? And it's going to be dependent on how much of the enzyme is present. Also going to be affected by how attracted that enzyme is to that substrate. So some enzymes are super efficient, super uh, effective. They bind really well to a substrate. We say they have high affinity, high affinity. So affinity means you like something. If you have an affinity for whatever, you like it. An enzyme has an affinity for a substrate. 
So high affinity, they're going to like each other a lot, so they're going to bind together super easily. That's going to affect that reaction rate. Temperature and pH are also going to affect the reaction rate. Um, temperature, because it affects the speed of molecules, how fast they're moving. So that makes a difference for uh, reaction. And pH, because it affects uh, basically that environment that these reactions are happening on. pH is basically kind of like how many hydrogen ions are floating around, right? So you can imagine if you have a bunch of hydrogen ions floating around in the environment that this reaction is happening in, say in the cytoplasm. So that might affect the enzyme and its shape because that shape is all dependent on the chemistry of these molecules. So when we're looking at a reaction rate, we can graph these things. Uh, so basically, substrate, those are our reactants. So our original components that we're putting in, um, so our starter pieces. If we have more substrate, a reaction happens a bit faster, right? So if you are trying to, let's say, bake some cookies, right? If you have a lot of dough, you can just kind of power through it, make a lot of cookies at once. If you have a teeny tiny cup of dough, you're going to be able to make a couple. And if you want to make more, you're going to have to go make more dough, go slower, right? So that's why substrate concentration makes a difference for our reaction rate. If we have more of something, it's just easier to make our product. So with a low enzyme substrate affinity, substrate concentration will increase the reaction rate, but not so much necessarily. If we have high affinity, high affinity, that's going to happen quicker, right? So if our enzyme and our substrate are really attracted to each other, they can find each other super quick. The reaction rate is way speedier. So at the beginning, it's going to be much higher. It's going to rise more quickly. Um, so we're still going to see more substrate it means this reaction happens faster. But we're also going to see that compared to an enzyme with lower affinity, this reaction is happening. So higher affinity means faster reaction rate. Next, we're going to talk about some regulation on enzymes. And we're going to have uh, four sort of types that we're thinking about. Um, and I'd almost break them into two groups. So our allosteric regulation and our covalent regulation are going to be about things that kind of bind on to our enzymes that are going to change the rates. And then these other two types of regulation are kind of going to be talking about the process of the equation. So feedback inhibition. When we see that word inhibition and we see that word feedback, right? Like we're thinking, like we've just been talking about negative feedback in the context of homeostasis, right? So we're going to be expecting potentially some kind of loop, some type of correction on something. And we'll talk about exactly what that looks like in the context of an enzymatic reaction. And feed forward activation. All right, these words are kind of the opposite of those words in number three. Um, and so we're going to see kind of an opposite process there uh, where we're, again, sort of changing speeds of this reaction. So we're going to start with the allosteric regulation. Okay. So looking at the enzyme, I should point out some things. So the active site is where we have that substrate bind in. So when we were talking about the lock and key or the induced fit, what we were talking about was things fitting into the active site. But the enzyme is bigger than just the active site. There are other places on the enzyme. So an allosteric regulation, we have some other molecule that's binding into a regulatory site. So somewhere else on the enzyme, 
And that changes the enzyme's shape, just like we saw with the induced fit model that sometimes when a substrate binds into an enzyme, it changes shape. So it's just binding in somewhere else that changes the shape of the enzyme. And that changes how well an enzyme can bind onto its substrate, because as the enzyme changes shape, it doesn't just change shape over here. It's changing the whole shape of the enzyme. So this is a whole big complicated. So allosteric does actually tell you what's happening here. So allo means different. And whenever you see stare as a root, so steric has to do with a place. So this is telling you that this is a different place regulation. So we have something binding into a different place different place than where a substrate is binding in. That's what it's saying. So in allosteric regulation, we have some enzyme binding into the regulatory site, which affects the whole enzyme's shape. So it also affects the active site and affects the activity of the enzyme as a whole. In covalent regulation, similar sort of thing is happening. Um, but we're going to have a covalent bond form. So that's going to be the difference between the allosteric regulation and the covalent regulation. So in the allosteric regulation, we had a regulatory site and we had that uh, other molecule kind of sitting in like a puzzle piece. We didn't have a covalent bond forming there, so it might fit in like a puzzle piece, but then it might pop out like a puzzle piece as well. In covalent regulation, we're going to have a chemical group actually bind on to the enzyme. So it is going to affect that enzyme until something breaks that bond. So this is basically kind of going to regulate it for a longer time or in a more controllable way. You might think about it kind of either way. So when we have covalent regulation, we might actually have another enzyme involved. So we might have enzyme A helping us form a covalent bond onto our enzyme. And then in order to get rid of that change, we'd have to break that bond, right? So we'd have to break off this extra chemical group to get back to our original enzyme. So this is a more controllable process uh, because we control the formation of that chemical or, or that covalent bond but we might have a sort of longer term regulatory effect. This is often going to happen with phosphate groups. Um, so usually that chemical group, that triangle in the previous image is some kind of a phosphate group. Um, so these are just two specific terms that you might see as you're reading through uh, any type of physiology text, right? So a protein kinase. Uh, protein, right? Our enzyme is a protein. Uh, a protein kinase adds on a phosphate group. So we're going to note this plus the protein kinase adds on an enzyme versus phosphatase removes an enzyme. This one, or it is a little easier to break down. So phosphate, because we're talking about a phosphate group. Ace is our ending for enzymes, basically, but the phosphatase is removing that phosphate group. So those are just two specific types of covalent regulation we would see. So regulation by protein kinases and regulation with phosphatases. And these might be working together because, as we saw, sometimes we're trying to add on bonds and then later remove those bonds. Um, so we're about at time. So we're actually going to continue with enzymes tomorrow and talk about this feedback inhibition and feed forward activation before we get into metabolism.